one, five, seven. Jesus paid it all. So it's no big deal if I give some back to him. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white. And on the last verse, and when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save. Brother, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Now, what a delight it is for me to have Brother Randy. Uh, it looked like he wasn't going to be able to make it here. He, is, he was working this afternoon, and it looked like he's going to be maybe miss the whole service. So I am so excited to see him. And good illustration, guys uh, and teenagers. Say, man, I don't have time, you know, to get uh, coming straight from work. You know, I'd feel awkward coming in, not dressing a little, little better. If it's straight from work, we're just glad to see you. Don't ever let that be a hindrance. And so, brother, you come and pray for us, if you please. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your blessings and your gifts and your, your love toward us. Pray that you be with us as we enter in this part of the service where we give back to you a little bit, little bit of what you gave to us. I pray, dear Father, you bless the gift and the giver. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be Amen. seated.
It is. It looks like Brother Folger to me. And uh, who can pronounce the couple's last name? Did you notice it? It's like Karen Colas <laughs> or something. It was real long, Karen Colas. But it's what a sweet song. What a beautiful song. And you can, did you notice that preacher? He's getting his Bible already. He's starting to rock. He's like, this song is just so good. I'm just getting so excited to preach the Bible. And he's getting, getting thrilled. So would you take your Bible, please, and turn. That gets me excited. Turn to Luke chapter 16 and verse number 10. Luke 16, verse 10. Pastor, what keeps you going? Why do you keep pushing yourself? And why do you keep pushing us the way you do? I mean, every month it seems like we have some kind of a special occasion, some kind of a special day. You want us to invite people. You want us to invite the neighbors. And, and it just goes on and on and on and on. Why do we keep pushing like this? And what keeps you excited? What keeps you going? Well, you know, a, a large part of the answer is found in Luke 16. In verse number 10, our Lord Jesus challenged the Pharisees with these words. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. And mammon is also known to us as money. In verse 14, and the Pharisees also who are covetous, man, they like the money. They liked everything money can buy. Money gets you respect and stuff and experiences and all kinds of cool things in life. And so they were covetous. They may have been religious, but they, they uh, had no problem with accumulating this world's goods. And so they were covetous. In verse 14, they heard all these things, and they derided him. They made fun of Jesus. Man, we're so used to reading these things, and, and to us it's so matter of fact, it's so common sense. Man, it's going to be God or money. You're, you're not going to be able to serve both. And you can have God and money. I praise God there are some very committed wealthy Christians. And I'm so thrilled that down in the San Diego area, there's a Jew businessman who got saved. And he's using his fortune for God's glory. And he built a beautiful facility in Tecate. He said, he said to the Spanish pastor at Lighthouse Baptist Church, Gil Torres, who serves under the senior pastor, Doug Fisher, uh, he, told, he, he met with Brother Torres and he said, Brother Torres, uh, I'm leading my employees to Christ. He, had a, he has a factory there on the border of the U.S. and Mexico. I'm leading my people to Christ but they have no church to go to. I need you to come and see what there is here. And so he, he, uh, he took Brother Torres down to Takati, and, and my wife and I have been down there several times. It's a, it's a dusty little um, border town right there. There's like a couple hundred people on the U.S. side and a few thousand people on the Mexican side, but it's, it's more like old Mexico. It's, it's a neat little town. Only thing unfortunate about it, it's also where they make Takati beer. <laughs> so there's this huge, you know, beer brewery there. But otherwise, it's a very pleasant town. We've had some good times there. Well, he took Brother Torres down into Takati and uh, showed him around. He showed him a building, a huge building he had. He said, Brother Torres, if you'll start a church here, you tell me what you want, and I'll build it th to your specifications. I have not yet seen the building. It's been down there now for several years. That happened not long after we moved up here from San Diego. And uh, I, I've not been down there. I've not seen the church, but I've been told it rivals some of the finest church buildings in America. I mean, it's state of the art. It's they have these beautiful screens everywhere, you know, and for directions and for you know, and, and in the auditorium and all, all around. And it's just gorgeous, beautiful facility. But that's a man using his fortune for God's glory. So he has the mammon, but he's not ruled by it. He's not living for it. It's, he, he, he's letting the money serve him. He's not serving his money. And so that's a man who's definitely serving God and can still have some money. But if it comes down to an issue, and this, this, you're going to have a collision. 
that first time that the you know they're, they're trying to pressure you to work on Sunday or Sunday evening or Wednesday night, and you you told them up front, I cannot work when we're having church. And that first time you have that collision course, man, we're going to find out where your heart really is. So uh, you've got to make up your mind right now, I will serve God, and if it costs me a job or a promotion or, or, or a certain opportunities, you know, if I have to l- learn to live with less, do without, just make do, I'll, that's, what, that's how I'm going to live my life. I'm going to serve God and not, not things and money and, and experiences and and, and prestige and all the things that money can buy. Now, this preaching of Jesus was poorly received by the hearers of his day, and I'm sure you sense it's not real popular when it's preached today. Instead of the repentance desired by the Holy Spirit, when you have someone who gets up and preaches the Bible like this, you're going to have people reject it. They're going to refute it and try to prove that you're wrong. And they're going to ridicule you. They derided Jesus. They're certainly going to make fun of us as well. And that's okay. You know, we'll see who laughs last when it's all said and done. In verse number 15, And he, our Lord Jesus, said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. Now that that meant a lot to these men because supposedly they were living for Jehovah. But, you know, the Lord said, you know, you make excuses that sound good to each other, but God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination. It's filthy. It's dirty. It's gross in the sight of God. Now, you and I can come up with excuses for, for not getting involved in the work of the Lord in a substantial way. Those excuses will make you feel better about yourself. They'll salve your conscience. They may satisfy others who want to justify themselves. So it's like, I'll accept your excuse if you'll accept my excuse, while you and I, neither one, are doing all that we know we should be doing for the Lord. But I have to wonder how those excuses will sound when you are facing the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you meet Christians who suffered untold privations and indescribable agonies so that ultimately your soul could be saved. You, you, I mean, you've got a Bible bought with blood. And, and people have died so you can have what you have here tonight. And when you someday meet them and have to face them, and they look at you and, you know, I, there's, a, there's a, an independent Baptist pastor who's, created some beautiful scripture songs and so forth. He has a great little song that he sings, and he's, he's having a dream, and he's in heaven, and, and he's, he's, he's there, and he's meeting all these great saints of old, and they're telling their stories about how they, the, the price they paid to serve the Lord on earth, and, and how one was, was, had been uh, killed and eaten by cannibals, and, and another had been burned at the stake, and another had been imprisoned, for, for many, many years. And they turn to the man having the dream. And they say, brother, tell us your story. Tell us what you did for the Savior. And he bows his head in shame, and he begins to weep as he has to admit he, he did virtually nothing of any substance for the Lord throughout his life. And, and that's, a, that, that's what we're trying to, I mean, we, we don't necessarily have to go out there with a death wish, trying to get beat up, or trying to get martyred, or trying to get fired, I mean, we don't have to be like another one of our young men several years ago who worked for Starbucks and began passing out tracks through the window at Starbucks until they fired him. Can I say, that's not a martyr, that's a moron. All right, so <laughs> that's, that's not the way to do it. That's their time, and that's their, their space. So no, they cannot get you to do something that goes against your biblical principles, but neither can you use your biblical principles as an as excuse to do something that goes against the company rules. Uh, so uh, and, and you have to understand, unless it comes down to a matter of principle. But I'm simply saying you can't say, well, I'm supposed to be a soul winner, so I'm going to pass out tracks to every customer that comes through, when you know that's, that would be not approved. I mean, if you have any doubt, just ask. Miss Manager, is it okay if I pass out these gospel tracks to everyone who comes in the door? <laughs> I'm sure she'll say, no, and that takes care of it, and, you, and you're under authority, and you're in a, and then 
in that environment, you submit, and, uh, and if you, you pray and they actually say, sure, <laughs> then have a field day, have a great time, go for it. Uh, but I kind of doubt that they will. It'd be thrilling, though, if they did, but I kind of doubt it. Now, what, what we're looking for is we're, we're not wanting you to have to look and sound pitiful when you're at the judgment seat of Christ and you glimpse those holes in the Savior's hands. And, and when you see the, 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 the scars of the, of the thorns in his brow and you realize he did all that for me and I did so little for him. So there's a line of demarcation that's set. In other words, there's a, there, there's a very clear border area between, that's been set by God between the spiritual mind that wants to serve God and the carnal mind that wants to serve things and have money and have those pleasures and have that, 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 that extra respect and all that goes with it. The spiritual man wants what God wants. And he's going to find a way to achieve it, even if he has to sacrifice himself. The carnal man wants what his flesh craves, what his heart demands. And he'll find a way to get it, even if he has to steal from God to have it. I mean, God's time at church, or God's time in ministry, or God's money that was meant to go to support the local church, or keep a missionary on the field, or, or in some other way, keep the work of God going. To underscore the principles he was attempting to teach to this hostile audience, Jesus shared with them the following story. Verse number 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And he, every meal was something special. He must have been an American. Man, he was just, he was doing really well. He must have been a Baptist preacher. Anyway, let's go on to verse 20. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, Seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Well, we need ourselves a rich man. Alan, you look just the part. Come up here, please, and be a rich man, if you would. That'd be great. Now, who do we have here that's a beggar full of sores? Do I have any? Who? Oh, William, you are so popular. Come up here and sit right here, please. And you can thank your teen friends who are girls. I want to avoid saying girlfriends, so that my friends who are girls, and uh, they, they, they got you in this, this mess. And uh, Oh, and we need, a, we need a very spiritual Abraham. Who's going to be our Abraham? Ladies, help me out here. Who do you think, Natalie? Ray Charles. Doesn't pay to try to hide your head when there's teenage girls around. That's, that's who they love to sacrifice. Someone who's really trying to avoid being in this, put in this position. So come on up, and you are Father Abraham. And, uh, you know, don't you just love this guy? Let's all sing in his honor, Father Abraham. No, let's not. That's not. Right. <laughs> Had many sons. Amen. You've been busy. You've been active. All right, so good. Actually, it only takes one. And from that line, there's, we're, man, we're all spiritually related to Abraham. That's how he has many sons. Now, you understand that Jesus is attacking some of the dearest assumptions of the Pharisees. Now, the rich man is, is where? He's in hell. The rich man is in hell. <laughs> Yet the Pharisees assumed that the rich were ultra good, ultra righteous people. That's why God blessed them with so much and allowed them to enjoy great wealth. And so, surely if anyone would be assured of a place in heaven, it'd be the rich man. This is why when Jesus said uh, that the, the rich, you know, it'd be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven, the disciples were shocked. That went against all their Eastern upbringing. You know, in the Far East, it's, it's just, and the Middle East, 
it's assumed if you have a lot, it's because you are so favored of God. If anybody's going to go to heaven, it's going to be a rich man. And the Lord really turned their little world upside down by, by putting the poor man in paradise. Now, he's not yet in heaven. Okay? And, and we'll ex I'll explain that in just a moment. But he is in a place called paradise. And he's being personally comforted by Abraham. Now, I'm not going to put him into Abraham's bosom, okay? But <laughs> except symbolically. Because I know there's a... There's a there's a limit you can push American boys, and, and it, it would just be, it'd be cruel, and you, I know, I know, yeah, so, <laughs> I know. So, but this will be illustrative of it. Uh, he, he's being comforted by, by Abraham, and these Pharisees, man, they claimed, you know, they'd be all about Moses and Abraham. So they consider him their ultimate father, you know, Adam, you know, the father of all of us, but for them as a race, as the Hebrew race, and the, and the reason why they were favored of God go, went back to Abraham, Father Abraham. So the Pharisees assumed that those who had ill fortune in life, those who were poor and sickly, they were ultra bad people, super cursed by God. And therefore, they were the ones who should have been in hell. The rich should have been in paradise the poor should be in hell. Because already in this lifetime, that's kind of how they viewed it. They saw it as being, you know, that's to us just common sense. That's just how, how it is. In an effort to shock the Pharisees to their, sen to their senses, Jesus described hell from the perspective of the rich man who found himself there. Because remember, this goes back to, you can't serve God and mammon. And gentlemen, Right now, you are so about your position as Pharisees, and it opens up doors of opportunity to you. People want to do business with you. They want you on their board of directors. They want you involved in their, in their enterprises. They, they'll give you sh uh, gifts of stock. They'll give you money. They leave money for you in their wills. I mean, it, it's kind of like, you know, in, in Buddhism, they'll send these boys out to beg, sometimes going house to house, and, and people will give them rice, and people will give them money, because they assume that if you're good to a priest, then your, your next life will be better. So people are willing to do that. So they turn these young men into professional beggars. And, and so there's just, there's just this assumption that uh, you know, if, you, if, you do, if you do good to them, and that's how I think people saw the Pharisees. If you do good to a Pharisee, and you, you, you give them money, you leave them in, a, a legacy in your will, you, you, you make him part of your business, though he doesn't deserve to be, that, hey, it, 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 God will then be, because they're so obviously blessed, then God will favor you as well. So Jesus has put the rich man in hell, and Jesus is going to tell what hell's like from the rich man's perspective. He's, he's, in essence, he's saying, guys, this is where you are headed to. Well, well, you are rejecting me because you don't want to lose your benefits here on this earth. The money, the, the prestige, and all that goes with it. Verse 24. And he, that's this guy, that's the rich man, cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, the poor man, that he may dip his finger in water... Oops, okay, get it all over my stuff here. <laughs> Dip his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, what do we learn from this one verse? And by the way, this is not a parable. It's, it's not identified as a parable. Every parable is identified as such. As my wife just said, names are named. And even if we want to call it a parable, who said the parable is make-believe stories? You know, a parable is not a fairy tale. A parable is not a legend. A parable is not a myth. A parable is not just simply a made-up story to, to tell. A, a, it's not an allegory. You know, to tell share, share truth. Uh, parables could all be very, very real. And so, even if you want to put it in that classification, it doesn't mean it's not a true story. It certainly is a true story. So, what do we learn here? We learned that hell is a place where 
lost souls cry out in anguish. Father Abraham. Say, how can they how can he talk to Abraham? If Abraham is in paradise and Lazarus is in paradise, well, a moment ago I made a distinction. I said that he is in what place? Paradise, he's not yet in what other place? Not yet in heaven. And that is because the way it was before Jesus died on the cross, rose again, and placed his blood on the mercy seat in heaven, before that was a, and therefore the saints who had died up to that point had their sins paid for by the blood of the Lamb. Up to that point, they were not yet able to enter into heaven. You know, maybe Elijah, Elijah, Elijah was an, an exception, perhaps. Maybe Enoch was an exception. But, but, uh, but I'm just saying that as the rule was, these guys are not ready to enter into heaven. But they have eternal souls because they're made in the image of God. So therefore, their souls would be held in the heart of the earth. There were two compartments, paradise and hell. Paradise, a pleasant place awaiting to go to heaven. Hell, a very unpleasant place waiting to go to the lake of fire. And so... They're able to communicate. There's a space between them. They say, well, what happened later? When Jesus, once Jesus paid for their sins, he came down into the depths of the earth and he took these souls with him into heaven. And I think since that time, hell has taken over the whole compartment in the heart of the earth. But we see here that hell is a place of anguish. Lost souls cry out in their, angu in their anguish. Hell is a place of intense loneliness. There was no one there for him to, with whom he could commiserate. No one there who had any help or any encouragement. Who, who, who said, I understand, I've been here a lot longer than you have, buddy, and I, and I know what you're going through. Nobody there to encourage him or give him comfort. The rich man cried to Abraham because there was no one else around to whom he could go for help. Those in hell are begging for mercy but their pleas go unheeded forever. Send Lazarus. Just a little cold water. But sorry, no can do. Hell is a place of utter humiliation. You realize Lazarus, this is, this is the guy who, as a beggar, used to be under the rich man's table getting scraps, and he would live off those scraps. And so... Now the whole thing is totally changed. Now he's having to beg that Lazarus can do something good for him. He had to beg Abraham to send Lazarus. And that was not going to happen. Hell is a place of extreme frustration. You have to realize he thought he had a right to call out to Abraham. He wasn't being presumptuous. Man, he'd been so blessed. He thought he'd been so blessed of God in his earthly life that it was a shock to him to find himself in hell. Many will say to me in that day, "Lord, Lord, have I not? Have I not? Have I not?" And he'll say, uh, I, "He says, I'll say to them in that day, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you." And so he's he's calling out to Abraham. And he's not getting the response he expects. You'd expect, maybe he's hoping, hey, if Abraham recognizes it's me, man, maybe he'll pull some strings and get me out of here. Or maybe he'll at least send Lazarus to help me a little bit here. But no, there, 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 he had no right, and he was denied. Once he was in hell, he lost all his advantages, all his rights, all of his authority was gone. We see, of course, in verse 24 that hell is a place of thirst. Hell is a place of intense heat. And we do know that the heart of the earth is a magma ball. It's, 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 it's liquid fire. Hell is a place of severe pain. I am tormented. And hell is a place of fire. I am tormented in this flame. And it doesn't matter that in his latter years, Billy Graham has wanted to change and, take, and snuff out the fires of hell. Doesn't matter that Harold Camping began to sound like a Jehovah's Witness and say, well, I think it's just annihilation, like the JWs think, that you know, after the judgment, you just snuffed out and it's over. 
Because we're, none of us are comfortable with the prospect of hell and the lake of fire. And I, I'm, I'm, I think any of us would be delighted if we find out one day God says, hey, I've decided I am going to just end the suffering and I'm done their punishment and it's over and we'd all, we'd all rejoice. But we can't presume that. We can only go by God's word and every indication God's word is there's no release for those in hell except for a brief time at the great white throne then they are cast in the lake of fire and this is the second death. And, it's, it's, and it goes on and on and on forever after. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let, let you go ahead and go now. Thank you, Abraham. Thank you, Lazarus. Thank you, rich guy. Sorry about that. And uh, remember, I didn't cast you. And I'm sure you'll get even later at uh, foosball or uh, the, at the uh, tetherball or some other way we, where guys rule over the, the lesser gender. Oh, boy, that was a bad thing to say. I'm... <laughs> You ask, <laughs> I think I just lost another latte too from Natalie, oh boy. You ask me, Pastor, how do you keep going? Why do you keep pushing yourself and us the way you do? It is because of the reality of hell. It's because good people, religious people, well-meaning people die and go to hell. No one ever said that the rich man was a bad man. Man, I mean, I don't know any of us that let the poor come in and have our leftovers in our, in our homes. But he did. And there were some very commendable things about the rich man. And it'd be better if he had not gone to hell. Now, I realize, beloved, and it's a hard thing to admit, but I realize I'm not a great soul winner, but I try to be a consistent soul warner. And I try to, as I go through my life, I try to keep, you know, putting out the gospel and putting out the gospel and, 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 uh, I, I want to do everything that I can to help you, likewise, be a soul warner. And some of you are going to go on to become soul winners much more accomplished than me. I admire members of our church that have been genuinely great soul winners. And I hope we'll have a whole lot more of them. But I do think all of us should, at the very least, be soul warners. And trying to intercede and try to reach souls before they die and go to hell. And I want to keep you motivated, you know, through the various things that we do, messages like this and publications and things that we do. I want to keep you motivated to keep going after those souls. And that's one of the reasons that we have the guest preachers we do. Dwight Tomlinson two weeks ago was a help to us, helping us to focus on this vast horde of humanity out there in the third world in the 1040 window that not only do they live, in many cases, a miserable life, but they die and go to an even worse eternity. And somebody needs to, to give them hope. Someone needs to take them the gospel. Either we need to go, or we need to finance someone who will go. We need to have a part in it. So that's the reason for doing all these things that we do. And that's why we have all these church events. Maybe there's someone in the community, maybe someone you know will not was not real keen on coming here for Easter, but maybe it's Mother's Day is their soft spot. And if not that, maybe it's Father's Day. And if it's not that, maybe it's Independence Day. And if it's not that, maybe it's Vacation Bible School. If it's not that, maybe it's Friend Day. Maybe it's First Responders Appreciation Day. Maybe, it's, it's, maybe what touches them is, is uh, Grandparents Day. Uh, maybe what gets them in the door is, is, is something else. And, and if, because we're having another event, it's okay, let's get, these, let's get these flyers out, get these flyers out, get these flyers out. Every one of our flyers has the plan of salvation on it so someone can learn how to be saved. Now, I do promise that all this activity will have an end. And you're going, oh, good. But it may come sooner than really you want it to. Because when you're all done here and you leave this earth, you'll kind of wish you had a little more time to have done a little bit more for the Lord. But at that point, gone forever is your opportunity to lead or at least reach lost souls for Christ and to show the fullness of your love for Jesus. Because he's, he, I mean, he likes the singing and he likes that we're in church and he likes these things we do, 
But the heartbeat of the Savior is souls. If we're not doing something to help reach souls, then we're going to get before him and find out, you know, I appreciated, you know, you gave some money, you sang some songs, you went to church, that was all very good, but I sure wish you'd done what I really wanted, and that's to reach some more people for me. Now, in the meantime, we do have this span of our lives. You know, it's been said that uh, many tombstones, they have the person's name, and they have a birth date, and a death date, and in between is that dash. So for me, it's September 7th, 1956, to whatever the end date will prove to be. And they say that your, what your life is all about what you do in the dash. And this life is going by fast. I realize it is a dash. But it's what you accomplished in that dash. So right now, we get to serve, and we get to preach, and we get to teach, and we get to counsel, and we get to share the gospel, and we get to give out tracts. And we get to pay our tithes so we have a church that's still functioning as a, as a spiritual lighthouse and a spiritual hospital. We get to give to the, keep the bus running to reach boys and girls. We get to give to missions so the gospel goes overseas. We get to give to be a blessing to our guest preachers because they're sent here by the Holy Spirit to, by the Holy Spirit to encourage us to be not weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So those guest preachers are valuable to us. They keep us motivated. They keep us fired up. They keep us going. Verse number 24 again, Luke 16, 24. And he, the rich man in hell, cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. And now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. In other words, there is a wide space. And it says, so that they which would pass from hence, from here to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. So we can't go to you, you can't come to us. Verse 27 then he, the rich man in hell, said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. In other words, they have the Old Testament. They have the Bible. Let them hear them. Let them hear Moses and the prophets. They'll, they'll, they'll learn about hell. They'll learn what God expects of them. Verse 30, and he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. By the way, we know that's not true because they, would, they were going to encounter another Lazarus risen from the dead. And you know what these same Pharisees had their attitude toward that Lazarus? We need to kill him. Because we don't know how to refute him, so we need to kill him. He's drawing people away from us. You give them, you give them a resurrection, and they still deny the truth. Beloved, there are certain souls out there that are just absolutely determined. They're not going to get saved, and they don't want anybody else to get saved. Now, we still have a, an obligation to reach them. We, don't, we, we can't prejudge who's got what heart. But my point is that that was a false premise in verse 30 just assuming his five brothers would get saved if they encountered a Lazarus who rose from the dead. And in verse 31, and he said unto him, this is now Abraham speaking, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, if they're not moved by the word of God, neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. Beloved, this is the most powerful thing on earth. I know nuclear power is phenomenal. I believe in it. I think you know, the nuclear, the, uh, a bomb is, is, is phenomenal. It's, it's mind, how do you say that? It almost sounds like a bad pun, mind-blowing. <laughs> it's very impressive. It, was that Lauren? It is mind-boggling. It is indeed. And, uh, but, it, you know, but we have something here that is even more powerful. This thing can change hearts. And like nothing else will, nothing else can. 
It, it, somebody said uh, to, to, to Spurgeon uh, at a time when England was turning away from the King James Bible, they were saying, Mr. Spurgeon, you need to get out there and, and, and you need to defend the Bible. He said, he said, the Bible's like a lion. You don't have to defend a lion. You just turn it loose. It'll defend itself. And this, this book, does a, if we just get it out there, it'll do a really good job reaching people. Now, these five brothers... I want you to think about them for a moment. We're talking about 2,000 years ago. Those five brothers had children who had children who had children who had children. And assuming that they survived the Roman siege of Jerusalem and, and, uh, and, and then 2,000 years of hatred of Satan and Satan's allies against the Jews, if they survived the Holocaust in Europe, I'm just suggesting that maybe by now there are tens of thousands, maybe even a far greater number of descendants of those five brothers on this planet right now. Some could live right here in Sonoma County. You know, we could still fulfill this man's wish to reach his relatives for Christ. And if, in fact, we don't reach his nieces and nephews of the rich man in hell with the word of God, and they don't repent and get saved, well, you know, there's still half a million souls for us to reach in Sonoma County, and about 36 million people in the state of California, and about 330 million in the United States of America, and what's mind-boggling is in this, one of the largest countries on earth, 330 million people, and there's still six to seven billion more out there. Now that, Lauren, that is mind-boggling. <laughs> you start playing with the numbers, and it is, it is, it, it is truly, it just, it, but it, it's not a matter that we, we, we just look at it and go, oh, boy, that's just overwhelming. I, I just can't even conceive. Okay, fine. But we can do our part. And if millions of other Christians are doing their part, and I'm so encouraged, I'm reading right now a, a, a newsletter from a, a preacher in England that is, is, he's a little odd, but he's odd in a good way. He's, he's, he's a cool guy. And he's out there in his part of England. Man, he's passing out scripture calendars. He's passing out gospel tracts. He's preaching on the streets. He goes to uh, fairs, and he sets up booths, and he gives out the gospel. And he's got a little crew of people that help him. And, uh, and, and when he couldn't find a Bible-believing church in his area, a King James Bible-believing church, he started one. He's got a little church. And he's a businessman. And he uses his profits to, to finance all this stuff. And, and he gets a little, little off the wall sometimes. He gets, he gets pretty enthusiastic. And he, he says some interesting things. But you know, the point is, he's out there. He's doing his part. And he's motivated. He's excited. He loves what he does. He can't wait to get up in the morning and do it some more. And, and that's, the kind of, that's the kind of guy that gets me excited and that's the kind of life I want to have. And I figure if he's doing what he's doing, and I'm doing what I'm doing, and you'll, if you'll pitch in and help, and I know what my son's doing, I know what other missionaries are doing, I, know what, I, I hear the stories that come back about the phenomenal things that are happening around the world, even in some Muslim countries. Man, there, there is a harvest of souls coming out of Muslim countries right now. It's just that it's very, for, for understandable reasons, it's very subdued, it's very quiet. But people are getting saved. Man, there's, there's, there's gospel broadcasts being, going in there, and there's literature getting in there, and there's, there's, there's believers that had got saved in Europe or got saved in America who are going back to preach to their relatives back home. And I know some of them end up getting martyred, but many of them continue on. It, it's, a, it's an exciting thing. The wrath of God demands that, there, that the sins of all those people be punished. The grace of God allows them to be saved. The love of God begs that they be at least warned. The greatest determining factor in, in the potential salvation of people all over the world is not their willingness to receive the truth. It's our willingness to share it. That, that's the determining factor. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? 
hey, I want you and me to be like Jesus. Jesus went around and he led people to faith in himself. And we need to give the Lord and give his gospel the position of preeminence in our lives. And then we will partake of the true riches he talked about earlier in this chapter. And it's not all about money and the things money can buy. There are some things money can't buy. You know what happened, Mrs. Miracle? After you and I are going to go home, and we're going we're gonna to both be in our, in, our, in our bed, side by side, and we kind of sigh. Oh, just good. Just the two of us. Once we finally kick out Trisha and, the, and, and her dog, that takes a while. because we, like, we enjoy having some Trisha time and some Max time. But Mrs. Beasley goes in her, in her little house at the foot of our bed, and finally the door closes, and it's just me and Mrs. Miracle. And right then, I don't even have to say Mrs. Miracle. I get to say Laura. And believe it or not, she gets to say Brother Miracle to me. And so she doesn't even have to say pastor or doctor, just, just brother. brother. Brother will be fine. And uh, so she, we're, we're there, and, and, we, and we're just, oh. And then finally... You know, we'll, we'll listen to some dumb old thing, you know, old radio show or something, and just just in, just a little bit of, of light entertainment. And then finally it's time to click out the light. And what happens to me after that, Miss Miracle? I'm out. Man, I am, I just, bam! I'm, it's over. Head hits the pillow. And you know what? There are people that spend big bucks and take a lot of drugs to get what I get just for serving Jesus. Man, it's, it's, it's the peace that passeth all understanding. And it's part of the true riches. Now, you do have an option. You, you can be a latter-day Pharisee and, and covetous, materialistic, all about pleasure, so that uh, you're, you're just not interested. Or you can help us get the gospel to men and women and boys and girls. You can help us disseminate the gospel. Now, tomorrow night, 6.45 in the foyer, you can help Brother Frank get the gospel. Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, West Wing, you can help us. And if those times don't work, hey, find a, south, find a partner and you and your partner go. Or grab some tracks, just go get them out there on your own. I, I have a lot of fun. Hey, we all need exercise, yours truly especially. We all need exercise, and I just love as I walk my dog, Man, there's a spiritual element to it. I'm out there, man, and putting out all kinds of literature. A lot of the stuff that you get here, I make extra copies of. I take it out, out in the community. I'm having fun. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm <laughs> doing some things I probably should not do, but I'm having a lot of fun doing it. And, that, and that's where I get my rush. Man, that's where I get, I, get, I get my thrill, as well as some exercise. And so and y y you can help in a ministry here at the church. You, you can, there, we have stuff going on Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday night. Just let me know of your interest, and we'll see where we might be able to place you. And you can help us in the matter of prayer. Even in a few minutes after the service, we're going to go to prayer. Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, we go to prayer. On your own, I hope that you are praying. And then there's the financial burden of keeping all this going. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So who are you going to serve? I, I, I still appreciate Joshua. I don't care how many thousands of times you've heard that message preached or the, you know, that, that scripture preached. I still love it. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's bow our heads, please, for a little bit. Lord Jesus. Thank you for teaching us and encouraging us tonight. And I pray that, uh, Lord, I know there will be many, many people we saw, knew, even loved in this life who will not be able to join us in heaven. They're going to end up in hell. And I just pray that many of them, if not most, if not all, will have been people we did something to share the gospel with. Lord, I pray our consciences will be clear and our hands do not have to be dripping with the blood of lost souls that were unwarned by us. And God, I, I pray that we'll get to see some fruit 
from our efforts. Perhaps even be surprised to find out that there's a bunch of people waiting for us in heaven who got saved because they found a tract we left somewhere or that we gave them and, and just didn't even think twice about it. I, I pray we'll meet some waitresses in heaven who got a tract with their tip. I pray we'll meet some people that found the gospel in a doctor's waiting room, something we left behind, something they found under their, their windshield wiper, something they found in their car door, something, Lord, that, that they found on their front door, something that they found blowing in the wind down the street. They picked it up out of curiosity and read it. And maybe after rejecting the gospel many times before, they're finally ready to receive it. Lord, I think of my former pastor, Doug Fisher, who used to swear at soul winners and street preachers and make fun of them and, and, and chase them away. And then in, in his hour of desperation, when he was contemplating suicide as a U.S. Marine, he reached up, got hold of an old gospel tract, and he got saved. Lord, I think of Kevin Wynn, now a phenomenal missionary in Mexico City. A teenager, Lord, lived not far from where our family used to live in San Diego. And tired of living the life of a, of a surfing bum, he finally decided to kill himself. And he reached to the top of the closet to get a gun to kill himself. And he found there a dusty old Bible. And in desperation, he read it he found the way, the truth, and the life. And now he's a great missionary, leading thousands to Christ. Lord, thank you for whoever it was that gave Doug Fisher a tract he initially refused, but couldn't get rid of. Thank you for whoever it was that got a Bible to the Wynn family that resulted in not just one young man, but thousands more being saved. Maybe in heaven we'll find out. Lord, like Wally Davis my understanding is that the man who led him to Christ has no idea he went on to become an evangelist, led many others to the Lord. And may that be so for us as well. God, thank you we get to be part of what you do. It's the greatest thing happening on earth. And I'm glad we get to have part of it. We thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Randy, you feel like leading a song? Come on up, brother. It's number... 64. Let's stand together and in honor of it being Brother Hackman leading us in the song, let's sing first and last. <laughs> he always makes fun of me doing first and last. First and last. On Wednesday night, I do a lot of first and last. All right, 64, we'll do first and last. <laughs> of my life I crown thee now thy shall thy glory be lest I forget thy thorn crown brow lead me to Calvary lest I forget Gethsemane lest I forget thy agony lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Thank you. If you can stay for prayer, please do so, otherwise you are dismissed.